Hello, everyone, and welcome to Du Cheng's thesis defense. I'm Corey Bartman, Du's thesis advisor, and I would like to extend a special welcome to um, to our external our external um, thesis committee member Gary Rovkin from Harvard Medical School, who will be joining us today, and also to um, Roland Richmond and Amy Sprouls from the Humboldt State and um, the and the uh, cell biology class from Humboldt State University who are joining us for this talk today. So Duke has come to my lab as an MD-PhD student, and it's always interesting to have an MD-PhD student in the lab. Um, you know, my lab is a basic science lab. We do very fundamental research. We work, as you will hear from Du, on the nematode worm, Cinerabditis elegans. And it's only when you have an MD-PhD in the lab that you come into the lab one day and find a 3D printer full of printed baby skulls. And this is Dew's 3D printer. And this was not merely a special Halloween project. It was Dew um, really uh, interested in developing new methods for neurosurgery so that using x-rays of the baby's brains, you could actually learn something about create functions of the skull, and then plan the surgeries really carefully going forward. And that was his first paper from um, early work that he did at Wild Cornell Medical School in neurosurgery. So this just gives you a sense of how active Dew is intellectually and how many different sides of Dew there are, which I've really enjoyed getting to know over these years. So for example, another side of Dew is Dew the entrepreneur. So Dew has made um, a little camera that can be hooked up into a microscope. It's called the um, lab cam and it's made by I do optics. And this is do is the only graduate student I've had in my lab who has, for example, a set of customer testimonials about all of the different people who have bought the I do and the work they've done with it. And I just like to point out that among these are Doctors Without Borders and the National Hospital of Peru because technologies like this that are available in low and middle income countries without a lot of advanced technology are really important, um, not just in, in, in graduate school, but in a much broader set of people. And Du's um, work in this area has also been recognized by um, this New York business magazine, Cranes, which every year has 40 under 40 recognized in its uh, magazine. And here's the picture of Du, the year he was recognized with his eye looking through the I do camera, looking very um, serious and professional. And this is like a great summary of do that comes from Olaf Anderson from the MD PhD program. He is fearless in a way that many students are not. And that is absolutely true of do. So we've been seeing the entrepreneurial side of do. We've been seeing the um, MD side of do. And now we've see, been seeing a new side of do. This is an early movie of his son, Quinn. Yeah. We're delighted to have him come along and um, be part of the lab family. And do as a father, I have to say, is also like quite amazing. Building um, his, his entrepreneurial and his building bent appears here. He's the dad that we always wish we had here, creating a swimming pool for his kids in the backyard and, of course, fencing it so that no one is harmed. And um, this has just been another facet of do's kind of wonderful, creative, physically creative existence that we've seen in his time here. So today, Du is going to tell you about the science side of Du. And I just want to point out um, in this that Du came um, through, uh, what, through what you could call serendipity or an accident into a new gene that's involved in learning in our model system, Cinerabditis elegans. And this gene is an element of the insulin signaling pathway. Now, insulin signaling is absolutely transforms um, the worm C. elegans into a different organism. It affects development, lifespan, metabolism, stress resistance, fertility. And even though we've known for a while that it affects learning, frankly, in my lab, um, we've been afraid of it. Or certainly, I've been afraid of it because it has so many different functions and so many different things. But Du is not afraid of anything. And when he discovered, um, sort of fortuitously, a gene that was part of this pathway, but that was not essential to some of these other functions based on previous work, but did have the learning defect. He was able to study that in detail and make new discoveries that he was able to tell you about today. And I just want to point out that he is the MD-PhD to the end. Two days ago, there was an article in the New York Times 
that specifically talked about insulin resistant diabetes and possible relationships to dementia risk and Alzheimer's disease in middle-aged people. So perhaps these things will tie together. We never really know if the discovery in the worm will tie together with people in a literal way, but we enjoy the discoveries and we enjoy each other as scientists and colleagues. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Over to you. Wow, that's quite a quite an introduction. Um, thank you so much, Corey. Um, I didn't quite prepare slides like that, but at first, I'd like to um, um, thank Corey for her um, being my advisor. Um, I always thought so. Corey, to me, she's like a she's first. She's a walking encyclopedia. She pretty much knows everything about science whenever you have questions for her and she's always giving you ideas and and if for those of you who don't know she's actually a fearless, fearless leader of the country right she uh, in terms of science and policy and she's she was the uh, president of the brain initiative and now she's the president of the chance back um, initiative um, managing all the uh, donation of um, mark zuckerberg uh, and Ch priscilla chan to science uh, and she took that job at the same time as she's working with us in lab. Um, as busy as she is and famous as she is, uh, one thing that she says she's always had time for students. She's always had time for us. And when I, whenever I need something, I email her at midnight. She will email me back at three a.m. <laughs> and help me help us through everything. Help us through COVID, checking on on us all the time, uh, which is you know a, an advisor anyone could ever ask for and I'm really great uh, appreciate that yeah um so <clears throat> let's start our um presentation uh thank you everyone for joining me here today on uh in New York as you see is uh, overcast here but none nonetheless the beautiful East River behind me and it's a real background stop uh, it's not the fake virtual background, but uh, so the uh, topic I have today and the title of my thesis is non-canonical axonal insulin receptor signaling drives aversive olfactory learning. Uh, the important things to know here is that insulin receptor drives learning and olfactory learning. And why do we care about olfactory learning? Right? Olfactory means smells. So that's because smell brings back memories. Um, think about when is the last time you, you, you smelled the campfires and how do you feel when you uh, smell coffee in the morning? How do you feel when you uh, smell the fresh cut grass? And what memory brings to you last time you had smelled popcorn um, or coconut, right? Um, so these, um, these, these memories uh, formed from the experiences are what defines who we are, what, what separate me from you and make us respond differently to different situations, right? So that's what personality stand, stem from and so our individuality stem from too. So um, i like to introduce a little bit about how uh, in the neuroscience we view these things are uh, formed. So there you have the human brain and the human brain is composed of uh, billions of neurons and trillions of connections and, and looks like the little wires. But these wires are not like your electronic wires that are solid copper wires. These are neurons and neurons are forming connection with other neurons. And these neurons, uh, these connections that form with other neurons are called dendrites or, 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 or axons. And the end of the dendrite axon, you have these things called synapses that connect to each other. And as you can see, it's not a solid structure. It's actually a hollow tube with very complica complicated structure where they can form connections and communicate back and forth. And when they communicate with each other, how they communicate is that they send molecules back and forth to each other. Uh, some of the molecules are called neurotransmitters, and the other molecules actually anchor the two parts together, deliver electronic signal back and forth. So that's how uh, we know that our brain works. You have molecules and delivering all these little functions and in the synapses and the all these synapses composed of these neurons and makes each of the neuron each of the neuron have many many synapses therefore fulfilling many functions they are like like little mini computers and there's billions of those in our brain and that's how um, why we're so complicated as animals and we can remember so many things in our lifetime and 
Um, this is how a typical form uh, or an example of how memory can be formed uh, is through a, a process called synaptic remodeling, right? So we, we, we said there were synapses earlier, and here is a simple diagram of a neuron connecting to the next neuron with a synapse here. Um, and if I if you you ask a five year old child saying what is a house to you right so they will have a representation of a house, maybe it's the size and shapes like uh, there is these triangles and these walls and uh, square windows, and so it's relatively simple in terms of connections. And as you grow older, more synaptic connections are formed to represent other um, uh, complicated things. Uh, to what your real house is like, such as, you know, like what kind of sightings do I have on here? What kind of work do I need to be done on there? Who am I going to call and all these stuff, right? So that's in the, maybe when you're 50 years old, more synaptic connections are formed and that representation might fade away. So these um, forming new connections and old connections uh, fading away is called synaptic remodeling. And during that process, new memory are formed and you grow as an individual. And on the molecular level, uh, there's uh, different ways of synaptic remodeling. Uh, some simple concepts and way of doing this is that if you look at a synapse where you have a uh, neurotransmitter from release from uh, this side to the other side, and these pink one uh, things sitting here are called the uh, receptors for the uh, uh, neurotransmitter, right? So you can increase, when you remodel, you can increase the release uh, from the synapse or you can decrease the release of neurotransmitter from the synapse. And also on the receiving side of the synapse, you can increase or decrease the, the, the receptors that receive the signals to uh, in the postsynaptic post neurons. So these are different ways of regulating synaptic transmission. Um, so that um, these, but it, the problem is that it's incredibly difficult to study these in especially higher organisms like human beings because the, the brain is a three-dimensional structure and all these structures, especially where you form um, memories and learning are deeply embedded uh, in the middle of the brain and, um, and, and there's just not really, a, some, not really a good way of access them in a living uh, living animal, like especially for human, you know, there would apart from ethical concerns, like obviously we can't do experiment on live human like that. But but apart from that, just to do like on higher animals in mouse like that is really difficult to to monitor the deep process directly. So that's why we turn into a simpler animals that can perform similar functions. Uh, so C. elegans is a excellent model for study neuroscience uh, and study the molecular process of the brain. So because they have 302 neurons and all of these neurons are actually visible through their transparent body. We can stick a microscope up there and see the neurons firing in action while the animal is behaving. Uh, it have very well understood genome and mapped out neuronal connections. And these um, is really helpful for us because we know which neurons is called and what their functions are. Therefore, it's better, it's easier to study how they work together. And they can actually smell many kinds of odors. And, and these odors, uh, not only by smelling them, they can, they can migrate towards it and they are capable of forming odor memories. So they can rem remember the odor is good, they can remember the odor is bad. Um, so, here I'm showing you a typical experiment that I performed in a lab. It's called a chemotaxis assay. So, uh, um, it, so you put the worm in the middle of an agar plate and you put a drop of uh, attractive chemicals such as uh, butanol. Uh, butanol is a uh, sort of clear liquid um, that is associated with C. elegans natural food source. It smells good to them. It smells good to human too. Um, so as when I put the worms in the middle of an agar plate, as you can see, they sort of spread out and start making their way uh, towards the odor source. Uh, but an important thing to see here is that they were not, not everyone is just went straight to the odor, right? They do a lot of different things, such as they do curved runs over here. And, and somewhere, sometimes they're going towards the wrong direction. And then they start um, doing a lot of these complicated turns and turns around. And when they come out of the turn, they're getting to the right direction and towards the older. So all of these are called the um, uh, motor behavior, uh, are, are called, um, no. 
uh, local motor behaviors, right? So the local motor behaviors are controlled by a network of neurons uh, of the C elegans. So on top here, first you have sensory neurons. There's many sensory neurons that sense different different signals, different odors, different um, or sense salt and all, uh, different stimuli. And AWC neurons specifically senses butanol odor that I was using in the previous slide. And when AWC neurons senses the odor, it through its axon, it sends out signals to a network of interneuron net, uh, uh, of interneurons. And these interneurons uh, will integrate the signals and, and, and possibly um, um, integrate it with other signals like food and other stuff. Uh, therefore, their output from each of these interneurons will be controlling the local motor behaviors. Um, so, and that controls when the work should go forward, when should they should go reverse, when should they should be making a turn and when they should be like steering towards one side or the other. Uh, so, as I said before that, you can also train the worms to uh, learn that an, uh, an odor that was good to them before uh, for them to not like it anymore. And on top here, I'm showing you the same video I showed you before where worms are or are chemotactins towards the attractive odor. But on the bottom, these are worms that I trained them prior to put it on the plate. As you can see, there were sort of running circles in the middle of the plate. Uh, and at the same given time frame, they didn't go to the odor. And the training is actually not very complicated. Basically, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a combination of food deprivation and the odor exposure. Basically, you will be starving the worm while giving the odor to the worm, uh, so they can pair these two signals, and as a result, this is what happens. I just to show you again uh, as a diagram how this experiment works is that worm usually live on an agar plate and on their food. The food is E. coli bacteria, and uh, when I take these worms, I put them on empty plate without food and control animal. They're only starved, and the trained animals are starved with odor. Right, so I take these animals that were trained once control ones trained and then subject them to chemotaxis assay uh, next and put them in on the plate, see which way they crop. And usually control animal will go to the odor uh, and the trained animal does not. And this is easily quantified by a index called chemotaxis index. And that how you calculate that is you take animal number of animals on the side that got to the odor minus number of animals in the opposite side and use that number to divide total animals on a plate. And as that, a result of that, you have the chemotax index. And you can see here, control animal has a high index and trained animal has a low index. So I'm going to use this graph throughout the talk to uh, show you the result, whether they learn and if, if they, um, so, and, and I can subject this uh, experimental setup to wild type worms that are normal worms or mutant worms, right? So if I mutate a gene, I, I delete a gene and the worms stop learning, then I can know, oh, this gene might be important for the learning. So that's how in genetics, how we test uh, mutant and make discoveries. And so that uh, takes up to, into the molecular mechanism of aversive olfactory learning. So if, uh, in the first experiment, one of the first experiments I did um, is that, as I said before, I took all these genes, as you can see, all these names of the gene. I took all these gene mutants of the different uh, mutant worms, and I tested them for learning and see uh, which one did not learn, right? So you have these normal range in the middle where control worms chemotax as well, and the uh, trained one did not. And this is middle in the normal range. And, and then to the right side of the graph, these are worms with less learning abilities. And then you can see on the far right, this one called FLIP20, um, the control worms chemotax well, and the trained worms also chemotax well. They didn't learn that this thing was bad, so they still went to the odor, right? And in compared to the trained, the, the one that were normally trained, then they don't go to the odor anymore. So just to make that bigger, so you can see better, wild type worms, um, control animals went to the odor, uh, trained didn't, but the FLIP20, uh, even after you train them, they still went to the odor. Uh, but what happened uh, is that I, when I take a second uh, mutation on the same gene that's also FLIP20, they actually did not have a learning defect. 
So what's happening here, right? Um, so, so what is actually happening is the typical method of producing a mutant animal is that we use chem, uh, chemical mutagens and radiation to blast the worms. And the same, and, and it doesn't just generate one mutation, it actually generate multiple mutations. Uh, so although we call this worm the flip 20 mutation, there's also other mutations like mutation X and Y and Z. Uh, and it's possible those are the real mutation responsible for the learning defect, not the flip 20. And that would turn out to be the case. So we actually did whole genome sequencing and the unknown mutation uh, X turned out to be as to one and as hidden in the background of the flip 20, right? So uh, just to show you here, this is a G, uh, the, the gene map of the ST1. This is a promoter region, and this is the coding sequence. Uh, you have this one and that one are the two different um, uh, mutant strains that, that, I, that, that I obtained from other labs, and both of them have a defect in learning. They didn't learn. They just look like the train one looks like control. And additionally, I generated three more uh, worm strains using CRISPR-Cas9. This is one of the more precise uh, way of generating mutations. And as a result, these three uh, mutant strains also have a learning defect. So that gives us more confidence and as T1 is actually a gene, not the flip 21 that's important for learning. Uh, so what is as T1 though? So uh, worm as T1 is a homolog to the human IRS. And IRS stands for insulin receptor substrate. It's a substrate that binds to the re insulin receptor when insulin receptor is activated. So um, to show, show you how this works in the cell signaling is that insulin molecules, this, this is a cell membrane, you have your nucleus here. Uh, when the insulin molecule comes uh, bind to the outside of this, uh, the, the receptor of the uh, insulin receptor, the insulin receptor dimerize and phosphorylate each other. It's a tyrosine kinase. Um, and then when that happens, uh, it provide a docking um, um, site for the IRS um, uh, protein. And the docking of IRS protein activate a series of uh, many different uh, in, uh, signaling uh, pathway inside the cell. For example, you have the MAP kinase uh, signaling pathway on the left side here shown, uh, on the right side I'm showing the PI3K AKT pathway. And the PI3 K AKT pathway is, is it's responsible for one, one of the most famous functions of insulin pathway, which is regulate blood sugar. Uh, it regulates the uh, insertion of glucose transporter onto the cell membrane, allowing the uh, glucose to come from the blood into the cell. Uh, both of these pathways together, they, uh, apart from the function of the glucose transport, it regulates a lot, a lot of other important functions as well, such as um, the regulate uh, a variety of transcription factors such as CREB, CJUN, C4, and FOXO. FOXO is the uh, Fort Heck transcription factor and mTOR. And all these transcription factor does is uh, turn on some, a lot of genes and regular other processes and at the end result, they regulate glucose storage, proliferation, differentiation, development, and survive, right? It doesn't just bring glucose into the cell, it's actually take, uh, tell the cell also take the glucose and do something with it. Um, so that's what an uh, insulin pathway does. And, and then my next question is this IRS or SC1 gene in the worms, where does it express, right? Um, so I put the SD1 promoter uh, onto GFP protein and the GFP will tell me where the um, SD1 express. And this is in the worm. Um, so we found that there's eight pairs of head neurons that express as T1. It's not expressed in the skin or muscle or any, anything like that. It's specifically in eight pairs of head neurons. So next question that I had was within the eight uh, pairs of sensory neurons uh, or interneurons, some are interneurons, which neurons specifically does as T1 works in to control learning, right? So the AS, AWC neuron, again here, that's the one that senses people know. Um, and their back neuron senses uh, oxygen and ASC senses salt. So uh, here's what uh, we did, uh, I did for the, uh, um, called a rescue experiment, where you have showing you again, the wild type animals learned, ST1 mutant did not learn. And this one showing you the genomic rescue where um, I put the, the um, ST1 gene back into the mutant, just showing you just putting back the whole gene rescues the learning. 
But here shown is that if I only put ST1 gene back into one neuron of the worm in the AWCR neuron that senses butanol, it also reg uh, rescued the learning. So this tells us that the specific function of ST1 in the AWC neuron alone is responsible for the learning of an older sensed by AWC neuron. Uh, and and here I'm showing you that these other rescues that put ST1 back into other neurons also, uh, but none of this really rescued the learning. Um, so this is the uh, C. elegant insulin pathway. Um, so um, uh, uh, you have a, uh, uh, it's sort of si it's similar to the human uh, insulin pathway. You have the insulin molecules binding to the uh, insulin receptor called the DAF2. Um, but the difference here is that worm actually have 40 insulin molecules versus human only have one insulin and one insulin-like growth factors and a few other ones that are similar to insulin. So worm has a lot more like molecules that, 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 that are structurally similar to insulin here. And the insulin receptor further activate PI3 kinase and PI3 kinase uh, activate um, the AKT pathway just like in human. And there is a balance uh, uh, here where um, PI3 kinase convert PIP2 to PIP3 and the P10 convert PIP3 back to PIP2. And, and this balanced pathway um, has some functions here too, in addition to the AKT, because the PIP2 actually can be hydrolyzed into IP3 and DAC. And DAC signaling is important for the PKC, which is protein kinase C, which um, has function to phosphorylate a, a bunch of substrates that's uh, required for synaptic vesicle release. All right. So my goal here today is that uh, we're going to look um, through this entire insulin pathway, see which member and which part, and how does this complicated pathway regulate learning? And in addition, where does ST1 fit in in this scheme? Because uh, traditionally in the worm, this was not quite really required for uh, the classic insulin pathway in worm, which is uh, development, growth, and, and formed our uh, form stress resistant uh, form of um, uh, worms. Um, so we'll look at all that together. So 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 I decided to start at the insulin receptor uh, DAF2. Right, insulin receptor is very complicated gene in worm. Right, it's not. It, it is one gene, but it has ten isoforms, and each of its isoforms are structurally different from each other. And for example, DAF2A and DAF2C, this, these are the two longest isoforms, and it differs by having an alternative exon 11.5 here. And this little exon encodes uh, what's shown in the red ball here is a domain uh, of the, uh, that binds to a, a transport um, uh, complex called the CASI-1 kinesium transport pathway. What it does is that um, this domain will bind to the transportation uh, complex where it literally physically walks the receptor onto the axon um, and allow the DAF to see to be uh, expressed uh, to be localized at the axon. And in on the other hand, the DAF to A who didn't have this binding domain is typically located in the cell body and a dendrite alone. And DAF to C is located in all these three places. And DAF to C has been shown to be important for learning. Uh, salt-derived learning in the ASC neuron. And this work is done by uh, the Eno group in, in University of Tokyo in Japan. So I was fortunate to get the, some of the mutants that they had uh, to test if DAF2, uh, the insulin receptor, have a function in learning. But here showing you again the wild type learned uh, and the ST1 did not learn. And a DAF2 uh, mutant that affect all the isoforms did not learn. And the DAF2 mutant only affect the DAF2C mutant also did not, oh, it also had a learning defect. So, uh, so because DAF2 has such, the insulin receptor has such broad function in the worms and, and it, it affect things like development, you can't just simply uh, delete that gene from the worm because the worm will not develop and they will not, uh, they will not um, uh, uh, develop and grow enough for you to test it. So therefore we 
when we ask the question, we know that the DAF2 is important, right? Next question is, in which cell is the insulin receptor is important? So to do that, we decide to generate a cell-specific knockout of DAF2, uh, which allows us to delete the insulin receptor from only a certain cell that we want to delete it from. And that way to affect the development less, and it also tells us the specific function of insulin receptor in certain cells. So how we did this is that on the, in the DAF2 gene, we inserted the two genetic sequence called the FRT sites. Uh, what the FRT sites, when we insert it into the non-coding part of the gene in the introns, uh, it doesn't affect the, uh, the, 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 the gene's function until we inject something called a flipase. A flipase is an enzyme or injected a, um, transgene that uh, express flipase. So the flipase acts like a gene scissor, kind of like it, it will cut out uh, any part of the gene in between these two FRT sites. So as a result, I'm just showing again here, WildTap didn't learn, the uh, WildTap learned, as to what mutant didn't learn. And this is the um, uh, result from the, uh, from the worm that carrying this, this, this genetic construct without the flipase. So no, no insulin receptor have been knocked out yet. So they still learn. But when we inject cell specific flipase into the AWC, uh, we, that, that, that's being driven only in, in the AWC neuron. So now we knock out the insulin receptor in the AWC neuron. Now you see a learning defect. So that tells us the DAF2, the insulin receptor in the worms, um, its function in the learning of butanone is, is only required in the AWC neuron. And to complement that result, we also did rescue, where in the wild type that didn't learn, and the DAF2 mutant that I showed you before didn't learn, but if we put DAF2A or DAF2C only back into the AWC neuron, as you can see, if I put DAF2A back into the AWC neuron, where um, you have maybe a little bit of effect, but if we took, put DAF2C back into the AWC neuron, it really rescues the uh, learning defect. So that again um, make it uh, tells us uh, in a stronger uh, sense that uh, the DAF two C uh, isoform of insulin receptor in the AWC neuron is important for the learning. So um, the next we wanted to look at the uh, DAF two C uh, localization since we already know that the DAF two uh, different as a form of the insulin receptor sort of localized differently. Uh, just showing you how we read the images that you have the, uh, so this, there's just a sketch here. It's, it's like a head of the worm and you have these, this is the AWC neuron and AWC neuron has a dendrite coming from the nose of the worm all the way to the cell body, the soma, and, and, and the axon come out of the cell and loops around and this is where it uh, it, um, it sends signal to the other cells. Uh, as you can see in these Im images here, you can only see dendrite and soma lit up. Uh, wherever lit up in, this, in the image is the fluorescent signal indicating the localization of the protein itself of DAF2A in these two images. So you can see that DAF2A is only local in the dendrite and soma. But if you look at the bottom here, these are images of DAF2C. And the DAF2C is located in the dendrite, soma, and the axon. Uh, the other thing we observed in addition to, uh, to the difference localization in DAF2A and DAF2C is that if you look at the, these are the DAF2C uh, protein localization in uh, fed worms that were they, they're, they're actively eating food. And these are the, uh, sorry, like they were, they, they haven't been starved. And these are the worms that have been starved for a while. And, and we've observed that the uh, level of the insulin receptor DAF2 has increased. Um, just to show you the quantification in the next slide, that if you can look at this graph, is that indicating the cell body, uh, and the y-axis is how how many fluorescent uh, uh, level it, there is to indicate how much DAF to C there is. Um, so in the wild type worms, uh, these gray bars are fat animals, and empty bars are food deprived and uh, like food deprived animals. And uh, as you starve the worms the level of DAF2C increases. But this increase is dependent on ST1 and INS1. When we knock out ST1 and INS1 in the worms, um, their um, DAF2C does not increase upon starvation. 
And that happened, that's also the same uh, uh, result happening in the exon of the AWC neuron, where, where wild type animals, um, when you starve them, the DAP 2 C will increase. But if you if you delete ST1 or INS1, the DAP 2 C does not increase when you starve the worms. It is a um, there's an important concept to understand here that uh, this increase is not due to increased transcription of the gene that encodes DAF2 because I'm not using the DAF2 promoter to drive the DAF2 to see um, uh, instead of using the STAR2 promoter driving it. And the STAR2 is the AWC neuron, AWC on uh, neuron specific promoter. Uh, and if I use that specific promoter to drive GFP um, and, and then I starve the worms, you can see I don't see any increase in the uh, uh, GFP uh, signal upon starvation. So the promoter is not causing the increase of the DAF2. See, it's not being newly synthesized. It's something else uh, there is, is causing the increase upon starvation. Um, and just to show you that the IST1 is also localized onto the uh, in the dendrite soma and axon. So IST1 is located at the same place with the uh, DAF2. Uh, so what is going on with the increase of EWC as a, in the DAF 2 C if it was it wasn't if it wasn't synthesized more right? So through literary uh, literature research, we found that uh, uh, ex experiment done in the human embryonic kidney cells shows that the DAF 2 C. Uh, sorry, this is not actually DAF. It's, it's insulin receptor in the human um, um, embryonic uh, kidney cells are constantly being uh, uh, turned over as they're constantly being degraded, right? So this degradation depends on the AP2, a classroom adapter, where it will um, help transport this into the classroom coated pit, therefore taking these out of the cell membrane to degradation. And as he, and our hypothesis is that as C1 here in the worms, uh, well, so in that study, also they show that as T1 can block the binding site of AP2, therefore block the uh, degradation and retain the DAF2 on the cell membrane. So that's what we hypothesize going, we hypothesize what is going on here is that upon insulin binding, the DAF2 is activated and upon activation of DAF2, ST1 are able to bind to DAF2, therefore stable this entire complex. Therefore, therefore that you require two elements. One is the binding of insulin ligand uh, in this case, probably ins one, and the other is required the ST one uh, blocking the uh, degradation, uh, and that's what caused uh, the inc uh, the increase in DAF two C uh, upon starvation. Um, so that's uh, that's what uh, happens to the insulin receptor. Um, but next, I would like to show you what happened to all the downstream uh, members of insulin pathway as well. Uh, so I already showed you the DAF2, the insulin receptor, and ST1 is, is required for learning. So from now on, any molecule required for learning will be tagged as blue color. And uh, so I'm showing you here that INS1, uh, one of the uh, insulin molecules, we tested is also required for learning because if you delete, if this is an ins one knockout, if you delete ins one and a trained animals does not learn, it acts like a control. Um, so if we move down the pathway and uh, onto H1 and to F18, as you can see, H1 uh, is also required for learning, and DAF18 is actually required for chemotaxis. If you knock out DAF18, they don't chemotax anymore. Uh, that will be uh, uh, shown in the, the pink color here, and, and any members required for chemotaxi will be shown in pink color. So DAF18 uh, convert PIP3 to PIP2, and the downstream of PIP2 is the DAC PKC pathway. And as I told you before, the DAC PKC pathway is important for synaptic vesicle release. And synaptic vesicle release is um, a required element, element for chemotaxi itself. And as you can see here, PKC knockout uh, is also required for chemotaxis itself. And uh, when you knock it out, they don't chemotaxis. The control one don't even go to the odor. And conversely, in the other branch where H1 comes to PIP3 and AKT, um, this whole branch is required for uh, learning. So AKT knockout uh, is also required. AKT knockout also don't learn. So that's required for learning. 
Um, so it looks like this makes sense. So far, you have this arm is required for learning that arm is required for chemo attacks. It's kind of a push-pull uh, situation going on. Um, but uh, when you go further from AKT function, it inhibits the um, um, DAF16, which is for head transcription, transcription factor. And when we knock out DAF, uh, DAF16, the worms also don't chemo tax. Uh, logically, this makes sense because AKT inhibit uh, DAF16, so this belongs more to this other other arm. Um, so we also did DAF16 and ST1 double knockout, and that ST1 knockout actually partially uh, rescued the DAF16 knockout. So this tells us that if if this branch um, function is only the only function of this branch dependent on inhibiting DAF16, then if I knock out ST1 as well, it shouldn't affect. This should have been looked like just like that. But uh, the um, fact that knocking out ST1 as well will partially rescue it suggests that uh, some member of this branch, probably AKT, uh, will have parallel function on inhibiting. Uh, synaptic vesicle release as well. So this doesn't just function on inhibiting DAF16. It might also af affect this branch as well. Uh, there's many uh, unanswered questions here as well. Like, for example, why is DAF16 um, uh, required for chemotaxis? Um, and we know that DAF16, uh, so, so maybe DAF16 can uh, regulate development and development, the normal development of the neuron is required for chemotaxis. And, and DAF16 and also can also uh, maybe regulate molecule required for synaptic transmission here. Or DAF16 can also even regulate molecules required for odor sensing, uh, maybe even odor receptors. Uh, we don't know these, so these should be tested. Um, and there's more question we have that we don't know on the input side of insulin signaling as well. All right, so INS1 classically, um, uh, that have been shown before uh, by research of uh, Dr. Uh, Ravkin here actually, is to, uh, its normal function is to inhibit uh, uh, DAF2. Uh, but in my case that I'm showing that INS1 is actually um, um, promoting and fac facilitating the DAF2 function. So that is controversial, but it's also possible, but since we have other 39 insulin peptides, we don't know what they are all doing here. So it's possible maybe INS1 inhibit uh, some other, in, uh, other neurons, and these other neurons release other insulin molecules to, re, to inhibit DAF2. So we know INS1 that came from AIA neuron, and then we know AWC neuron receives, um, AWC neuron, the, the DAF2 on AWC neuron is being activated, but we don't know if that's a direct connection coming from AWA to AWC. So it's very possible that INS1 secreted by AIA is go to other neurons, therefore inhibit uh, AWC uh, with a double inhibition loop, and that could make more sense. So this is kind of what commonly happened in the study of a molecular pathway. I can map out what's happening in the middle and everything, uh, how they affect learning, but that leads to further up, upstream and downstream uh, to other signal pathways and, um, and lead to other people's work. And all of us working together at the end, uh, we can figure out what's going on with the whole process. So now I have showed you how uh, the molecules end up in AWC uh, 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 neuron affect learning. And now uh, the next question is what happens to the neuron itself? What, what kind of function has it changed? And that leads us to the neuronal mechanism of, of, of factory learning. Uh, so there's one important concept that I want to show you first is um, the concept of uh, desensitization, right? So top I show you again is how aversive learning that I was training the worm for. You take the worm off the food, give control no odor, train give them odor. As a result, they do not, uh, the trained one do not chemotax. But what if I don't take the food away? I just put the food, like I just give the worms odors and, and, and see what happens. And because like, if you go smell flowers, like for a prolonged time, you won't smell it anymore, right? So that process is called desensitization. And can we train the worm? Does that happen in the worm at the same time uh, when you are doing this training? Because anytime you give the uh, you give the stimulus, that itself can have an effect too. 
Uh, as a result, if I use high concentrations of butanone on the worms, and they actually are able to be desensitized as well, uh, but lower concentration uh, when uh, it didn't happen, that they didn't desensitize. And this is different from the aversive learning where you give all the different concentrations, they all learn. So they're more like pairing the older and the pairing the presence of the older with the starvation. Um, so therefore that tells us um, if older was used, the desensitization is probably a component of aversive learning as well, right? So this is always happening in this as well. Uh, it's important to uh, show you this concept because we might be able to separately test this pro these processes in the following neuronal um, function testings. So this is uh, sort of showing you uh, what we can test in the neuronal function. So you have the AWC neuron again, you have the dendrite, soma, and the axon, right? So you got odor comes in and signals come to the soma. And the soma can respond by changing its calcium level uh, as its activity. And that we can monitor with the technique called uh, GCAM imaging. Um, and as the uh, cell body responds, it, it may or may not send signal to the next neuron, depends on the state. And that sending to the signal is depend on synaptic, ves synaptic vesicle release. These are where when the uh, neurotransmitters release from AWC neuron to the next neuron. And that we can actually monitor using foreign imaging. Um, so first I'm gonna show you what GCAM imaging can do is this is how we actually do it. So we have these really complicated setup. It's called a microfluidic chip. This is a chip and this is what looks like. The chip looks like in the microscope from above. And you have all these vials of odors and buffers that can be, be delivered into the chip and the worms are sitting in the chip and receiving these signals. At the same time, you have these microscopes sitting under the chip and it's actually recording what happens in the neuron of the worm. Uh, here, and this is technique was developed in, the, in our lab and it's one of the most exciting things that the, uh, actually uh, prompt me to, to join the lab, which is really cool. Uh, so this video shows you what looks under the microscope uh, when a pulse of uh, fluorescent dye is being flowed through the chip. So you can add the dye and remove the dye. And this is what would happen uh, with older molecule as well when I stimulate the worm with odor and remove the odor. Uh, that's how the experiment we can do. And in the same process, we can monitor how the neuron respond to it. And here is the results. And I'm showing you the GCAM imaging result. And uh, you have the wild type up here and S1 mutant down here. And how you read the graph is the y-axis is the fluorescent signal of the AWC neuron and, and the axis, X -X -X axis is the time. And as time goes on, and we will add different stimulus, first with buffer and increasing level of uh, older uh, solutions. And uh, each time when the older solution is added, it's indicated by a gray bar. And if you follow this black line, they indicate control animals. And as, as we start adding the low concentration, uh, low concentration older solution, you see the, the neuron actually respond by having the curve goes up and down. And this becomes more intense as you increase the uh, level of uh, odors. Um, and if you look at trained animal, what happens in low concentration, they actually don't really respond. It didn't really go up and down here. And it, it's only starting to respond more intense with much higher concentration odor. And this is what exactly happening in the IST1 animal as well. Uh, so this we hypothesized is more correlate with what uh, the concept of desensitization because you have uh, the neurons uh, response to the odor itself. Like you stop responding to the lower concentration, uh, you respond better to the higher concentration after you um, give them odor. Uh, and, and in the ST1 didn't have any defect in this process, right? So ST1 have a defect in learning, but in this process it didn't have a defect, it's probably the desensitization. Uh, when we move further down on the neuron, so, so we established that ST1 mutant did not have a defect in desensitization, but what about the release of neurotransmitter? Um, so that's when we move down to look at the foreign imaging uh, to the synaptic vesicle release. 
So first we wanted to know like what kind of synapse, uh, what kind of neurotransmitter is being released from the AWC neuron to the, to the other neurons. And we know that AWC neuron synthesize glutamate, uh, but to just to, uh, we need to know whether the glutamate is re responsible for chemotaxis. So here I'm testing glut glutamate knockout in a AWC neuron and glut glutamate knockout everywhere in the worms. As you can see, wild type animals control chemotaxis really well, uh, but the, uh, if you knock out glutamate, they actually don't chemotax very well. So that tells us the AWC neuron indeed uses glutamate as a neuron transmitter for chemotaxis. Therefore, we, um, we, can, we can test the release of glutamate uh, uh, release using eat 4 fluorine, which is developed by Donovan, uh, uh, a previous lab member. Uh, so here again, so showing the graph is similar to the one before. The y-axis is fluorescent level and x is time. And uh, control, anim control wild type animals as you add odors indicated by the gray bar, they respond by changing its uh, release of glutamate. But if you look at the trained animal, they actually, the response is much more decreased upon odor addition. Uh, in ST1 mutant animal, control animals, the control uh, group, they respond just like wild type, they respond to the odor addition by changing its glutamate release. The trained animal didn't decrease it's um, a release. It's sort of like, just like the, uh, it maybe decreased a little bit from the control, but it still respond really uh, robustly. Uh, that's very different from the wild type. And this is what we think is responsible for learning here. The wild type, the learning in wild type is to, uh, to inhibit the glutamate release in response to the odor. And we're in IST1, it didn't have a learning defect, it still responded well. And here is a quantification in, in wild type animals. Um, trained animal have a much less response in the control. In ST1 animal, the, the trained animal responded just the same in terms of glutamate release uh, than the control. Uh, so that's what, uh, what, that, what I, a, a summary of what we, I've shown you so far is that we're, you know, we, we've studied the insulin signaling in, in the AWC neuron and looked at how that affected the glutamate release into the new interneuron network. But the question is that what happens after that? Does that further uh, affect the locomotor behavior? And is that why ST1 animal uh, didn't learn? Um, so, so to look at the locomotor behavior, uh, here's what I did. So I have uh, shown you here uh, a single trace of animal, uh, the path it took from the start to getting to the butanol. So the followed, this is a, the graphed out uh, how the path of the animal came all the way from the start to the end. And every time the animal does a uh, reorientation, I can, I can check and to look what, what the head angle of animal is heading to. So what happens here if for an animal that doesn't have eyes, right? And if you think about like, how do you get to the place? Is that if you just blindly walking and then you sensing the odor concentration decreasing, like, oh, I'm, I must be doing something wrong, right? So I have to make extra effort, make a couple of reorientation. Hopefully when I come out of it, I'll be pointing the right direction. But if I'm walking to the right direction and the odor concentration is increasing, I must be doing something right and let's keep walking. So that's called a bias random walk model. And in this, in this case, I'm showing you the animals only doing this Jurassic uh, reorientation when their head was facing away from the odor, which is consistent to the bias random walk model. And these are control animals. And with the, uh, this is the trained animals, but I show the same thing that they actually start doing these reorientation. Uh, sort of seemingly uh, randomly and not, not like when they're, not only when they're facing away from odor, they're just doing it whenever they want. And that's probably why they're running in circles and not getting to the odor. Uh, so if I quantify that, and I can show you that wild type control animal has this bias where they do more reorientation when they're facing away from the odor, trained animal did not do more orientation when they're facing away from the odor. So they've lost that bias random walk. And then the ST1 animal, S1 mutant animal, actually retained this bias even after the training. So that's probably why 
uh, they were still being able to keep on tax and they didn't learn. So just a summary here, what I show you so far is that, first of all, I showed you insulin pathway and how the insulin pathway from the receptor and the intracellular uh, signaling pathway can work together to affect synaptic vesicle release. And when, when animals is, um, when you train the animals and insulin pathways at work to inhibit the uh, change in gluc glutamate release, and that's what happens in learning. And that further leads to regulation of bias random walk and the learn, learn animal uh, lost that walk uh, while in the mutant of insulin pathway, they didn't. So that's why the insulin uh, pathway mutant, someone who's on the show you could not conduct aversive learning. Uh, why is that important? Is that in actually in mammals or and, uh, is that insulin uh, signaling and glutamate signaling is also important for, uh, uh, insulin also regulate glutamate for learning. Uh, in the hippocampus and basal forebrain, it controls for me, uh, the memory formation, emotions, and associative learning. And uh, it's been found that insulin receptor present in high levels there. And further more that insulin regulate AMPA and NMDA type glutamate receptors and GABA receptors as well. Um, so there's also uh, a link, as Corey mentioned before, that uh, uh, insulin is linked with di uh, cognitive functions as well. So diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And diabetes, especially type 2, is associated with increased risk of cognitive uh, impairment. So with that, I just uh, want to highlight the significance of the study again is that first we gained the understanding of the molecular interaction of the insulin pathways uh, in the learning process. And then we also found that the function of the insulin pathway in learning is self-specific. But I've showed you that IST1 and insulin receptor DAF2 are both of them have specific function in a single cell to control a single learning process. And I also showed you that the insulin regulates learning by inhibit glutamate release. Uh, so this is sort of a typical, typical um, way thing we do in science is that what we hope is that we can, we can use science to inform medicine, right? So in the worm, we use a simple, in the worm, we can work out in a simple brain uh, with less cells, we can work out the complicated molecular pathways. And once we work that out, hopefully we can use that information to, to maybe develop drugs or other therapeutics. And eventually with that, one day we can um, improve mental health that way. So with that, I would like to, again, thanks Corey for taking me on this incredible journey and all the past lab members who have uh, taken me into lab and taught me everything. And, and also current lab members, they're always there um, uh, helping me whenever I need. Margaret here um, uh, in the one slide I didn't mention was one who helped me making the uh, DAF2 uh, knockout. Um, so I'd like to also thank my collaborators here with, um, from uh, University of, of Tokyo, uh, Dr. Yuichi Ino's lab. Uh, I'd like to thank my committee members, Dr. Vanessa Ruda, Dr. Soho Tavazoi, Dr. Connor Liston, and Dr. Gary Rothkin. I'd like also to thank uh, um, the MDPHE office, uh, who gave me a chance when other school didn't give me, uh, Dr. Uh, Anderson and uh, Dr. Busford has been really good to me. Uh, and, uh, and I also like to thank all the uh, advisors I had who brought me to where I am coming from a state college um, from Humble State, Dr. Jamin Jones, Dr. Amy Sprouse, Dr. Jacob Varkey and Dr. Roland Richmond. Uh, they've been incredible for uh, sending me on this journey and up in Rockefeller University. And also uh, after they sent me to Stanford University, Dr. Joe Helms and Dr. Bolios uh, taught me so many things. And uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my funding sources as uh, NIS training grants has allowed us uh, MDPHE students to be um, paid through these long trainings and also PD Soros Fellowship of the Americans. At the end, I'd like to also thank my families and my friends, my parents, who is in China right now, stuck in China, um, and my, um, my partner, Heather and, um, and Quinn, and 
and they've been incredible, um, taught me the meaning of life, uh, and all my friends in the program and, and everyone. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, this was a picture of Bar Barton Lab in 2018. This was a picture of Barton Lab in 20 2028. Oh, sorry, what did I say? 2118. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I don't know if there anyone have any questions or what's the next. Uh... I do. I'm going to share a slide for QA instructions. Uh huh. Do what's next on your agenda? Um, so next, I'm going to uh, go back to uh, medical school, finish the MD PhD program, and then I'll figure out how to best combine my interest in research, in entrepreneurship, and in medicine. Um, it's uh, there's many choices, and I am not exactly sure, but I will find out. Donovan has his hand raised. Hey, do nice talk. Hey, Donovan, how are you? Good, I'm good. Yeah, yeah congratulations. Um, yeah, yeah I, I guess my question was just on the synaptic release, as you can guess. <laughs> um, uh -huh. yeah. Do you have any idea what you think might be inhibiting the release of the vesicles? I mean, it seems like the calcium levels are not that strongly affected. Um, so that makes me think maybe something downstream of the calcium, something like snare complex or somewhere around there. What, what's your thoughts? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's very, um, that's a good question. And um, I, I'm not sure, but I can only guess uh, there's, you know, first of all, uh, you have all these kinases on the insulin pathway and we don't know their, uh, we know their usual targets are, but in this case, we don't know specifically in AWC how they affect um, uh, the molecules that could be, be important for the functions of uh, the molecules such as snare complex that um, that I can uh, um, that's important for the snap vesicle release. Uh, as a matter of fact, the gene use study, the PKC1, is so complicated is that uh, when I do a double mutant of ST1 with PKC1, it pushes the PKC1 to repel from the odor further. Mm. Um, Interesting. Yes, I don't have a clear answer for you. And that's mm -hmm. could be someone else's PhD project. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so it gets really messy, really difficult down there. Yeah. Did, yeah. did you happen to test any of like, like, I know like SNP1 or something, for example, can kind of chemotax, but can it do any learning? Did you ever try that? No, I just test uh, Tom one though the Tomosin and uh, yeah effect. Um, okay, yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah, cool. Thanks. Question from Naveen Pokala. Hey, do congratulations! Hi. Awesome Thank talk. Um, so um, I have a question. You had um, you screened a bunch of mutants, and you uh -huh. had some that were on the same end of the spectrum as IST one. Uh -huh. Then you had some others that had the complete opposite effect. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could speculate a little bit about what's going on there. Did you try any doubles? Like any of those suppress the IST1 mm -hmm. effect? And maybe that could give some mechanistic insight into Donovan's question. Sure. Uh, just a shout out to Naveen here who developed the code for me to track the animal positions on that. And he helped me with um, getting those um, quantification of the bias random walk as well. Uh, so in terms of the, your questions about the, um, on the, all the way on the left side, there's many mutants that actually kind of like super learners, right? They control animals that uh, chemo tax well, but the learned animals, instead of not going to the odor, they're actually running away from the odor. 
namely uh, three, uh, three alleles of MPR1, the newer peptide receptor one had that phenotype, uh, but MPR1 has a complicated history as MP1 doesn't, MPR1 doesn't just affect learning, it actually affects the aggregation of the animals. And, and so the function of MPR1 makes animal run away from oxygen, aggregate in the part of the food that has the most high concentration of CO2. Um, I have did the mute, double mutations where we're using NPR1 mutant while killing that URX neuron that senses oxygen that makes them less of repelled. So sort of you take out the oxygen CO2 effect out of the equation, see what the NPR1's function is. And in that case, unfortunately, the double mutant was made in a weaker mutant, the AD609. Uh, and the most strong allele in this case that has the super learning was KY13. So I didn't really get any meaningful result as the difference was too small. But moving forward, if anyone will look at it, I would suggest killing URX neuron, PQR neuron in the KY13 allele. Thank you. Elias Scher has a question. Hi, do. Great Hi, talk. Uh, um, I was just wondering if, you, so um, two things on the, the first thing is, I guess, you know, the hypothesis is that the starvation signal is actually the INS1 itself, but um, is it, could you speculate a little bit about how the starvation signal is being integrated into the learning? And do you think that's happening at the synapse itself through, through this pathway, or is there any other possible explanation? And my other question is, um, it looked like when you knocked out glutamate in AWC, Mm -hmm. alone, it decreased chemotaxis, but there may have been some residual difference between the training and the, um, and the control. So how do you account for that if you think that, the, um, that this is being orchestrated through glutamate synaptic release changes? Mm -hmm. Yes. So for your first question that you asked about um, on how is um, the insulin signaling uh, uh, function in the starvation signal. Um, so, well, as what I could have, what I have already shown was that, uh, let's say INS1 was the starvation signal. It did regulate it, the DAF2's um, uh, level by, uh, and through the co collaboration with the IST1 pathway, right? But does that, you know, how does that uh, affect the insulin pathway itself. I think the more questions that were, how does that collaborate with the older signal, right? So when you have a different, okay. So it's, it's more clear that uh, um, INS1 increases DAF2 during starvation and that's the older signal. But when you have a different outcome of uh, combining, uh, combining that with food or uh, sorry, combining that with odor we're just giving older without combining with that starvation signal. That's when it gets a little more complicated. Um, since I don't have the entire information about how older signal uh, integrate into the insulin pathway with delivers food signal, um, I don't really know, really know how to quite answer that, but I can speculate that uh, maybe we can look into GPCR pathway, uh, especially like so from other study, we know that uh, G alpha Q was important in food associate learning. And uh, the G protein sign uh, has signaling have many different um, um, intracellular pathway members that can have a chance to integrate with the uh, insulin pathway. So that's what I could speculate so far on that. Your second question about how glutamate knockout was not completely chemotaxis defect. So there's a few things we can say about that. First of all, uh, we like to think the AWC neuron is the only neuron sensor speed no older. But we have done like early days when I was working with Christine and Sarah Abrahamson is that uh, you know with higher concentration of you know you can elicit the response in other neurons as well. Although we don't know if this was directly activating other neurons or activating 
it will see it and it will see activating those neurons since we don't know what the neuroreceptor actually is. Um, it's possible, you know, other neuron can sense higher concentration of albutinin. And the other thing is that um, we like to think the AWC only secure glutamate into the interneuron network, and that might not necessarily be true, right? So what are the other insulin molecules doing there? It's very possible that your, uh, some other insulin molecule could act as the signaling or other neuropeptide, like uh, there's uh, two other family of neuropeptides can also, in addition, acting as neurotransmitters from AWC into the uh, 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 inner neuron uh, network. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a different kinotaxis, I forgot which neuron, that there's two dopamine, I think it was there's two dopamine receptors um, I forgot it was dopamine or serotonin, but but one one of them affects two aspects of the reorientations. Uh, one act affect the frequency, the other affect the. Um, uh, anyway, I think I'm going too far on that, but anyway, it's it's possible. Other, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Richmond has a question in the chat. Can you tell us whether or not the worm's response to odors uh, changes as a function of how, when they age? Uh, as a matter of fact, it does. And uh, it's possibly it's related to insulin signal, uh, signaling as well. And uh, uh, the study by the uh, Colin Murphy group actually showed that, uh, uh, well, that was, that was G protein. Uh, but yes, uh, other group has seen that uh, worms don't, does change their uh, odor detection sensitivities and through aging, and um, and that's related to insulin signaling as well. Yeah. And another thing is feeding status. Like um, as they get older, the the feeding gets inefficient, um, and and the feed like the nutritional status is of the worm itself also affect their ability to chemotax. Like if you think about worm who are fed. Like, why would you go out of your way to find something else? And if you're starved, then that's what motivates you to go find things. So thank you again for coming and for being with us. Um, thanks for asking questions and being engaged. And um, Du will now meet with the committee to defend his thesis work. Um, and um, wish you the best and, and Till next time.